Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our first episode of LRBAA today. This uh, episode is on public safety threat prevention. So just a little bit of background. The LRBAA is a tool used by s and to solicit and seek solutions for our needs and our mission areas um, from industry. And the topics on the LRBAA are intentionally broad and high level to make sure that we're able to encompass the vast um, missionary for DHS. This webinar, because those topics are broad and high level, this webinar is designed to help provide better context for the role that DHS s and plays in those mission areas and um, the space that we're working in currently under each one. So as we move through the different particulars of that research area may change. So I am very pleased to be joined by Kathleen Delockery and Ajmal Aziz. Um, if you guys could please talk about your, um, who you are, your role within s and on this um, particular research area. Thank you. Thank you. So I am a program manager um, within s and and the Mission Capability Support Office, where I'm currently the, um, leading the Public Safety and Violence Prevention Program. Uh, where my main objective in working with Kathleen um, is to conduct evidence-based research to create a multidisciplinary approach into how we as a department can mitigate and prevent acts that put an individual and group's safety into question. Um, I have a relatively robust portfolio, as Dusty mentioned, which focuses on targeted violence and terrorism prevention, combating human trafficking, um, countering foreign influence, and technology acceptance. The goal with these research activities is to develop knowledge, tools, and approaches into how um, we can improve our response to these threats while passing our findings to stakeholders and end users so that they have the tools that they need to make informed decisions in diverting vulnerable individuals, um, mitigating vulnerabilities, enhancing community resilience, uh, all with the intent to boost our preparedness and response in the faces of uh, these various uh, social and behavioral threats. Hi, everyone. My name is Kathleen DeLockery, and I am the acting deputy for the Enduring Science Technology Center branch. Um, I'm also a subject matter expert in the Social Science Technology Center, which is underneath that branch. As Ajmal mentioned, we're really looking for interdisciplinary approaches to key mission areas within the Department of Homeland Security. Within the Technology Center, we're also more focused on advancing science and fundamental research, even if it doesn't um, transfer directly to an individual DHS component. We're also looking in the key mission areas of targeted violence and terrorism prevention combating human trafficking, and countering foreign influence. To dive a little deeper into each of those, within targeted violence and terrorism prevention, the DHS goals are, that s and supports are to understand the evolving threat, to prevent acts of targeted violence and terrorism prevention, and to enhance US resilience and community preparedness. Um, also note that we're now not just talking about terrorism prevention, but also the prevention of targeted violence. Our hope is that we can use the tools, techniques, and strategies that have previously de been developed in countering and preventing terrorism and apply those to all forms of grievance-based violence, including targeted violence. Within combating human trafficking, we're looking at both preventing and protecting. So within prevention, we want to reduce the threat of human trafficking through better understanding and sharing of information. Within protection, we want to both disrupt illicit activity and assist victims towards stability and recovery. Within countering foreign influence, we're really interested in understanding the threat of online misinformation and disinformation and increasing resilience by making consumers of information more resistant to manipulation. All of the research that we conduct at DHS s and and under this broad threat prevention category should inform policy, strategy, tactics, techniques, and procedures 
both at DHS and across the Homeland Security Enterprise. Thank you guys. That's, that's a lot of information. Um, I will say as much information as that is, we still want to <laughs> dig a little deeper. So those, those are again, very, very big goals, very important goals, and we want to we wanna be able to succeed. And so there's areas of, this, um, of these missions that have better um, technology that may be on the horizon that we can take advantage of. So what is, what is s and more specifically working on now in those, in those spaces? Sure, so you're right. Those are really broad mission areas um, and really key to DHS as a whole. Within each of those mission areas, we're really interested in research and development uh, around four key capabilities. And those are evaluation, capability enhancement, data development, and international cooperation. With evaluation, we're looking to provide independent and objective evaluations to ensure that our stakeholders who perform, fund, direct, select, um, or oversee any prevention and protection activities can better understand and predict what their impacts and effectiveness will be. In other words, we wanna see what works, what doesn't, and what's promising. Um, within capability enhancement, we're looking towards the development of new tools, techniques, or knowledge that will enhance the Homeland Security Enterprise operator's effectiveness. And then within data development, we're looking for the development um, analysis and reporting of new scientific data on the nature of threats, organizations, um, and criminal activities to better understand how to prevent and protect against future public safety threats. Um, across all of these areas, we cooperate and coordinate with our interagency and international research community partners. Yes, and that's, that's a great segue into my next question because we have so many ways that we can go about um, doing further research. We have all kinds of tools within industry partnerships. Um, we have other federal agencies that we can partner with and see what they're doing. So given the fact that we have all these resources, um, LRBAA is just one of them. So what are the, um, what are the, the pieces of, this, of these issues and these challenges that we're looking at, particularly as a, as a, a candidate for LRBAA? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> You know, if you look at the, um, the DHS FY20 strategic plan or um, the strategic framework for countering terrorism and targeted violence or the DHS human trafficking um, and child um, sexual exploitation, uh, exploitation strategy, um, you can kind of see how the department looks at s and to ensure um, rigorous high quality data is developed to better understand the nature of the threats um, in the U.S. Uh, one of the key drivers for us here at s and is to provide independent and objective assessment um, of activities to ensure that we can uh, continually, imp continually improve and understand the outcomes, impacts, and unintended consequences of investments uh, within the deep Um Our goal is to provide sufficient information to allow evidence-based practice in this area through building the corpus of scientific knowledge and working with um, close partners uh, and with frontline communities of practice. Um, and then I'll also kind of send some links to the, uh, the strategy documents that I referenced because that's really our um, roadmap for, you know, how we're looking to engage through the LRBAA with ultimately supporting um, the department and the HSE. Thank you for, for sending those out. And we're also going to have a, a slide at the end that will help us um, be able to communicate the information to folks so they can, they can get to those documents readily. So um, the LRBAA, we have, as, as you guys have mentioned, this is, these are not new areas. These are areas we, we work on on a continuing basis. And, and based on that, we have entities, organizations, um, folks within industry that we've been working on with this through, through the history of it. Um, the, the 
LRBAA is, is open to a very broad range of, of industry. And so I think, you know, looking at this, I think often there's a misconception with when I talk to um, even like small businesses or new organizations outside DHS or, or federal government, they say, oh, well, it's so hard to get in. You have to already know. You have to be a player already. This is, this is an area I think that is, is really good for helping to bring in some, some new participants in this area and include some diversity in terms of background, research areas, um, perspectives. Can, can you talk about how you feel that plays into this particular area of research and this LRBI topic? Sure, so I agree. It's been really great to get perspectives from new people um, and new research ideas coming in on the LRBAA. Um, I'll give an example from the past. So DHS has been working on counterterrorism and terrorism prevention um, since its inception, right? This is, this is why DHS exists. Well, about four or five years ago, we started looking into doing evaluation in this space to better understand, as Ajmal and I have both discussed, you know, what works, what doesn't, what's promising, how is how we're spending our money, is it effective or not? Um, when we started working in evaluation, we had individuals with backgrounds in public health who came to work with us. Uh, this was an area that had not worked in the terrorism prevention space very much in the past, but they knew a lot about evaluation of local community efforts. They knew a lot about how to reach hard to reach communities. And we really benefited at DHS from getting them involved in the terrorism prevention space. So that's been super important to us. I think the other reason that the LRBAA is so important um, is because it gives people the opportunity to send us their big ideas that might not necessarily fit into a targeted call for proposals that we put out. So just to throw an example out there, um, one area that always comes up, whether we're talking to our international partners or interagency partners, whether we're talking in the human trafficking, foreign influence, or terrorism prevention spaces, is how are online and offline behavior related to one another? Um, it doesn't really fit easily into a targeted call, but the LRBAA is a great way for people who have ideas about these big questions that can solve multiple policy issues to submit them to DHS and give us the opportunity to see new perspectives. Um, so thank you for that. And I especially like where you brought up the fact that there was a, bringing in somebody that was outside what we would think of as the typical space and, and industry or research, you know, sort of areas. I think that's, that's an important one, especially in terms of this, this new perspective and this new aspect of it. I think that's a great way. And it, it's kind of hard for us to put it in terms that of what we're looking for when we're not really sure what we are looking for. So this, this is an important way to communicate to folks. Look at the essence of what we're trying to do, not necessarily get stuck in the research area that is a traditional, you know, stovepipe or something like that. So thank you. I think that's, that's a great example. So we, um, in talking about this, I think what's important is while this may be an area that we want new players to come into that aren't familiar, there's still, we're still incumbent that we're looking at meeting regulations, meeting standards, understanding the space and what is and is not um, able to be done and how we can, how we can accurately do that. So can you talk about um, some of the, the considerations that folks need to be aware of in terms of um, meeting requirements under this research area? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, we're in a very interesting situation as a lot of our work doesn't end up developing a technology or a system, um, but really on ensuring that we have access to high quality data and knowledge to just better understand the nature of threats. In doing so, we're able to equip our senior leadership with data to improve our knowledge base while refining our tools and techniques to really ultimately just affect a better outcome and ultimately prevent acts of violence from occurring. The, the goal for, for our project program is really for our science and research to inform policy. Um, we're not an intelligence agency. 
Uh, there are other agencies and departments that uh, kind of work in that mission space and have that remit. s and is not one of them. Uh, not really interested in anything that aims to track people or perform surveillance of any kind. You know, I want, we want to maintain public trust. So it's critical for us to protect privacy, civil rights, and civil uh, liberties. Um, you know, we adhere very closely to the DHS standard terms and conditions as we fund applications that are in, in alignment to those uh, um, various strategy documents that I uh, passed earlier. And you know, we also request that applications describe any potential impacts to privacy, civil rights, civil liberties, um, and ways in which they plan to prevent or mitigate um, those project impacts in really a non-discriminatory uh, manner. Yeah, and I know all of the folks at ST have been feeling the impacts of a, a, a renewed um, and um, reconfigured privacy review for everything we have going forward. So I certainly want, it's a great point to make sure folks understand that from, from our perspective. Um, for my next question, one of the things that you said earlier kind of um, I think is important to this. When you talked about like evaluation, you said, well, what works, what doesn't work? And in looking at the receipt, so this, you know, LRBAA is sort of a three-step process. We start with a, um, with a white paper, and then we recommend whether to go to virtual pit, and we recommend, you know, from there to go to written proposal. So there's, there's elements that we need to review as we go along that help us determine whether we want to go to the next step. Um, what are some of the aspects of, of what you've seen in the past and sort of something being submitted that help you understand, I, I think this is something that we could go to the next step on and may have some, some, some worth for us to pursue. So the first thing that we always look at when a proposal comes in is making sure that it's mission relevant to the DHS mission. It may be a great idea. It may be something that could move science forward. But if it doesn't fall within our mission set, we're not going to be able to fund it. So that's the first and most important thing for proposers to think about when they're submitting. Um, and as Ajmal has pointed out and sent you the links for, I believe, um, especially when it comes to the targeted violence and terror terrorism prevention and combating human trafficking, we have up-to-date strategies from DHS in these two areas that came out in September 2019 and January of 2020. Those strategies call out specific needs for further research and development. And so they're excellent guiding posts for individuals who want to submit new proposals and want to see what DHS's needs are. And then as someone who reads the proposals coming in um, and sits through each of those three steps that you laid out, Dusty, um, I think that the most important part of the new LRBA process is the virtual pitch. The virtual pitch is an opportunity where, you know, we are talking directly to you as the proposer um, and you're presenting your research idea to us and we're asking questions in real time. The best full proposals that I've seen are the ones who are able to take those questions that we asked in the virtual pitch and even if you didn't have an answer or a great answer at the virtual pitch, you are able to think about it, realize that we asked the question because it's something that's important to us and incorporate it into your full proposal. Um, and that's where I've seen people really be the most effective once they get to that stage. I think that I think that's an excellent point on the virtual pitch. I think often we get wrapped up in this. Um, oh, it's our idea to push information. This is this is the chance to to send information and and, and convey that. But it is also a really important time for being able to receive information and, and process some things. I think that um, also kind of on a, a bit of a note from the administrative side of this, if we receive a proposal or a submission that is an identical submission for multiple um topics which we have in the past we don't forward those and and part of the reason I, I i try to explain to folks is that they may they may have some applicability in different areas but you should be tailoring what you're submitting so that the people on the other end understand exactly how it helps them in their space and likely that's not going to be able to be done using the same words and the, and the same presentation so i think that's also important is making sure you understand how what is being presented is beneficial and, and important for you. So thank you. That was that was great information. So 
Let's get to a question I get a lot and one that was submitted as part of when folks were registering is funding, 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 funding. <laughs> so why don't we give funding thresholds on LRBAA? And there's a, there's a couple reasons. One of the ones that I think is um, sort of the best one to help um, industry understand what they, how they can act on this. You know, there's, there's things that nobody has control over from, from this perspective, but one that they do is that, you know, we, when we're putting this out, there's broad, there are high levels, and the things that you guys have talked about are, are just, have varying differences. And so the proposals we receive for those could be vastly different in terms of what funding is appropriate and required for those, those proposed efforts. Can you talk about some of what you've seen along those lines to help folks understand why giving a funding threshold may not be as helpful as, as they may think it may be? Well, again, that's a really good question. Um, and you know, I'll be able to kind of uh, preface this by, provide, by providing you with an idea of really what the funding threshold looks like for a lot of the work that at least uh, uh, we've been able to pursue. Uh, but before I'm able to do that, you know, I, I do want to emphasize how you know, we are really eager to you know, work with the private sector to really get a better understanding of you know, where the state of technology currently is. And it's, you know, Kathleen kind of touched upon it. You know, we have a very broad portfolio. So um, you know, that could also include things in, in regards to how we're adjusting to you know, the current COVID landscape. Um, so you know, the disinformation you know, uh, portfolio that we referenced earlier is definitely one of those emerging needs where we're looking to kind of work with um, DHS partners to really kind of support efforts to you know, kind of combat uh, the disinformation um, uh, place, you know, during COVID to just get a better understanding of, you know, what the impact is for um, individual students or whatever it may be. So, you know, we're very interested to hear, you know, what um, private industry has to kind of offer on that, in, in that regard. In regards to the funding, um, you know, I think the, the one recommendation that I have is really just to be realistic. You know, we're stewards of taxpayer dollars here, so it's imperative that we ultimately get uh, the best value for the government at the end of the day. Um, a lot of our efforts over the last, I would say, the last three years have ranged from um, um, applications valued at $100,000 to those valued at about $2 million. Um, so I, I would say roughly the average project is probably about 500 k um, The one guidance I can give as you submit proposals is really to structure your submission so that um, there are discrete pieces of work um, over a longer period of time. So if we're able to identify $500,000 a year for a three-year um, lifespan, uh, rather than just requesting a large chunk of money up front, um, that gives us a better ability to really secure the funding um, within that fiscal year, and then really make, making sure that we're able to um, hit the necessary milestones that um, have been identified to then get us into uh, the secondary and uh, tertiary phase. Yeah, and, and I think it's it is important as a as somebody who's proposing this to kind of make sure you understand how how the how it would break into pieces and what those funding pieces look like, but what the what they would be, because when you go into the virtual pitch, if there's a whole bunch of conversation about one area and you need to make sure, okay, we need this is important. And then as as it's discussed, you know, there's an aspect that is kind of deemed that this isn't this isn't as important. And and to be clear. During the virtual pitch, you guys are not allowed to um, give guidance like you need to, to do this as well, which is why they need to make sure they're listening to those questions. But as well, it's a way to make sure you, you get the relevance of the different areas of, of the proposal and, and what is most interesting and impactful. So before we go to, and, and we, um, you sent out some links, um, Ajmal, to the, um, the documents that we've referenced. Um, before we, well, we're going, we're showing that now. Um, so as we're doing that, let's talk about um, ideal outcomes for, for this topic and any additional advice we may have not touched on that you have. Yeah, so really the ideal outcome for us is to bring more people in to proposing to grow the number of people in academia, industry, you know, nonprofit organizations who are looking to advance science um, in the areas of the DHS mission, right? Especially when it comes to targeted violence and terrorism prevention, 
combating human trafficking and countering foreign influence. Um, and you know, we'd like to see proposals that advance the DHS mission that address capability or knowledge gaps in our policy and operations or that move the science in these areas forward and hopefully lead to an award in the future. So I think that that's all that Ajmal and I have for you today, but we're happy to take any questions. Did, um, did you want to give any context, further context to the documents that we're showing um, or is, are we we're good? Um, just the two at the bottom are the two that Ajmal and I referenced most often. Right, those are the specific strategies for the mission areas that we really focus on. Um, the two links at the top, I would say, are broader and would probably be beneficial to proposers, regardless of which topic area of the long, uh, of the LRBAA they're responding to. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so um, there is a question that is a little bit of logistics of will the video be forwarded to the participants. We are going to send out information um, on how folks can look at this recording, um, the recording of this session after. Um, but going into some of the questions that are more um, specific to this particular um, subject. So um, one of them is, are there specific types of technology solutions, artificial intelligence, intelligence predictive machine learning, et cetera, that are of particular interest to DHS for the LRBAA topic. Is this one that is? Um... Sure, so um, DHS and DHS s and are always looking at new and emerging technologies, um, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, you know, 5G, Facial recognition, these are kind of all emerging tech that we're looking at across different mission spaces. Um, at this point, I don't think we have any current projects that integrate these fully into the four mission spaces we're looking at. Um, Ajmal and I are also involved in, I think he mentioned at the beginning, technology adoption. So we have efforts looking at um, what the public thinks about DHS use of these technologies. And we use that to then help inform DHS policy and operations in the rollout of the technology. So. All right, here's a good question. What should the end goal of a proposal be? Is it a de-risk technology or finished product? No, I would say the end would be ultimately to help us really kind of derive knowledge, tools, techniques. And I know we keep harping on, you know, those three things um, so that we can ultimately, you know, pass that information over um, to our senior leadership and policy so that they have a better understanding in regards to, you know, why we are, um, you know, saying certain things in regards to how we need to kind of shape um, you know, our approaches as it relates to, you know, terrorism prevention or, or um, um, foreign influence, because it's really backed by um, an evidence-based data that really kind of helps provide that, um, that level of fidelity to just reinforce what we're at least seeing from a science and technology perspective. Thank you. I think, and I think one of the things, I think that's a great question because often um, people misunderstand and think, oh, well, I've got a product. Let me advertise it to s and through the LRBA. I'll submit this. And, and we're not in the business of procuring end products. This, um, if you, and I, if you look at the LRBAA solicitation um, on page one, it lists the three types of um, research concept areas that we can take um, submissions for. So it's something to look at. We're, we're not, s and is not in the business of purchasing products. Um, we're coming up on um, 1.30, but I think we have at least one more question that I thought we might want to chat about. And this is, um, somebody asked the question um, on how this topic may be relevant or related to first responders. Sure. So. <laughs> All of the work that we do in these mission spaces up, up until this point, and our goal moving forward at all points in time, is to do this work unclassified. Um, 
These are, especially when we're talking about targeted violence and terrorism prevention and combating human trafficking, these are local problems that are usually going to be, um, you know, addressed, uh, mitigated against, and recovered from in local communities, which means that we need our results in the hands of local communities. So we try to make all of our reports unclassified. Um, when it comes to targeted violence and terrorism prevention, we have a website on the DHS s and site that has all, all of the research that we funded in the past few years. If you Google DHS s and terrorism prevention, it will probably be the first link that comes up. Um, and so we really see first responders, um, but not just first responders, but you know, local official, local, you know, mental health professionals, educators, um, social service providers, we see them as potential end users of the research that we do, and we want them to be able to access it. Thank you. So we did get a lot of questions. Uh, many of them are related to how to submit or, you know, how to get information about their, their ideas. So we do have um, some information we can present that shows um, the URL for the, the portal. Um, I, following Kathleen's lead, though, I will tell you, if you Google DHS LRBAA, it is the first one that comes up. But yes, this is, this is the link to go to. Um, when you go there, make sure that you are on the research area tab, um, which is the long range broad agency announcement part. Um, and then searching under research area, select preventing terrorism, and you will get to PREV 0403 which is the number for this particular um, topic. So I wanna thank both Ajmal and Kathleen and all the folks that helped support this uh, webinar for participating today. Um, at the bottom of the page we're showing is the email link for our office. So you can send follow-up questions there that we may not have been able to address. But again, if, you're, if your question is, how do, you, how do you contact Kathleen or Ajmal, that's not, the goal of this, the goal of this, <laughs> that if there's an, a, an appropriate, or you think something that, that is appropriate to submit to this topic, then this is the way to, to go. I will, I will say that as I um, pitched the webinar series to folks, I kept telling them the idea is not simply more proposals. The idea is good, relevant proposals. So hopefully we've been able to communicate some information that is helpful for that. As I have mentioned several times, this is a series. So we do have the next one scheduled and that's for countering unmanned aerial systems. And that is scheduled for August 20th and it's gonna be at 1 p.m. Eastern time again. So um, hopefully we'll see some folks um, or you'll see us and we'll be chatting in about a month. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.